Now, of the 140 million centuries since time began, every one of them was once the present century. And of the 60 million centuries to the end of the world, every one of them will be the present century. The present century is a tiny spotlight inching its way along a gigantic ruler of time. Everything before the spotlight is in the darkness of the dead past. Everything after the spotlight is in the darkness of the unknown future. We live in the spotlight. Of all the 200 million centuries along the ruler of time, 199,999,999 centuries are in darkness. Only one is lit up, and that's the one in which we happen, by sheer luck, to be alive. The odds against our centuries happening to be the present century are the same as the odds against a penny tossed out at random on the road from London to Istanbul happening to fall on a particular ant. Well, in spite of those odds, you may have noticed that we are, as a matter of fact, here. Uh, and it, it really, of course, it's not surprising. We're here because uh, we're the ones doing the calculation. If somebody has just done the calculation that we've just done, then that somebody, of course, has to be alive. Nevertheless, I do feel rather lucky to be alive, um, and for another reason, too. Now, the smoke going into the beam represent stars. Each particle of smoke represents one star. And you can think of the beam as a gigantic searchlight beamed out from space and signalling from our planet in the hope that somebody else on another world will pick up the message. We don't know how likely it is that there is anybody up there. We can say that if our message does hit another planet, then almost certainly it'll be so far away that if those people up there had a telescope looking back at us, then what they would be seeing is not us at all, but the dinosaurs that was here 65 million years ago. Or in other words, our message will reach people uh, millions of years into the future. People vary in their estimates of how much life there is likely to be, how likely there is to be life on other planets. Some people think that, uh, some scientists think that um, as many as 10 million technologically advanced civilizations are out there. Other people feel that this life here on this planet is the only life that there is. But even on the most extremely optimistic estimate, it's still true that most of those worlds out there are going to be deserts. Most of them are not going to have any life on them at all, nor even any possibility of life on them at all. Now imagine a spaceship full of sleeping, perhaps deep-frozen explorers, would-be colonists of another world. Perhaps they're the last population of Earth, despairing that Earth is about to be destroyed, sending out a colony to look for another planet anywhere in order to carry on humanity. Imagine that the spaceship turns out to be almost unthinkably lucky. It does chance to arrive at one of the very, very rare planets capable of sustaining our kind of life planet of the right temperature with oxygen, and so on. The passengers wake up and stumble out into the light, and they see a beautiful world of waterfalls, green leaves, mountains, coloured animals and bird-like creatures flitting about. Can you imagine how it would feel if you woke up? Perhaps after a hundred million years of sleep in a spaceship, and found yourself on such a world, a whole new world, a world that you, such as you could live on, a beautiful world. You'd surely bless your luck in arriving on such a rare world, walk around in a daze, a trance, unable to believe the wonders that met your eyes and ears. Well, this will almost certainly never happen to us. And yet, in a way, it's just what has happened to us. We have woken up after hundreds of millions of years of sleep, Admittedly, we didn't arrive by spaceship, we arrived by being born. But the wonder of the planet, the dazzling surprise of it, is the same, whether we arrive by spaceship or by birth canal. We are amazingly lucky to be here, privileged. And we must not waste that privilege. Here, it seems to me, lies the best answer to those narrow-minded people who are always carping on about the use of science. 
The founder of these Christmas lectures, Michael Faraday, was once asked by the then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, what was the use of science? Sir Faraday replied, what is the use of a baby? She says her name's Hannah. <laughs> Faraday said, what is the use of a baby? And I've always thought that what he meant by that must be that a baby has such potential. It may not be able to do very much now, but it will be able to do a lot. But it's also possible that what Faraday meant was that there's no point in bringing a baby into the world if all that it's going to do is work to go on living, to go on living and work to go on living again. If that's all the point of life, then what are we here for? There's got to be more to it than that. Thank you very much. Some of life must be devoted to living itself. Some of life must be devoted to doing something worthwhile with, with one's life, not just to perpetuating it. This is, of course, how people quite rightly justify spending taxpayers' money on the arts and on conserving rare species. But sometimes when we justify academic science on those grounds, people get rather philistine and say things like, oh, so you think the government should spend money on your scientific research because your research is fun for you, do you? Fun isn't really the right word, is it? After sleeping for 140 million centuries, we have finally woken up in the universe. We've opened our eyes on a wonderful planet filled with colour, teeming with life. Before very long, we shall have to close our eyes again. Finding out about the universe in which we've woken up, answering questions like, what are we doing here? What is this universe in which we've woken up? What is life and what, if anything, is it for? Surely the enterprise that answers questions like that, science, deserves a better title than fun. Put like that, doesn't science sound to you like just about the most worthwhile way in which you could possibly spend your short time in the spotlight? Now, of course, if you spent all your time wandering around the world gasping at everything and saying how wonderful, how amazing, uh, I've woken up after 100 million centuries, what a trip, people would think you were a bit odd and you might even get arrested. We do, of course, have an ordinary life to get on with. We do have a living to earn. We've got to earn our living being a solicitor or a lavatory cleaner or something like that. But nevertheless, it is worthwhile also from time to time shaking off the anaesthetic of familiarity and awakening to the wonder that is really all around us all the time. So how are we going to shake off the anaesthetic? We can't actually go to another planet, but fortunately we don't need to because we can go to regions of our own planet which are so unfamiliar that they almost might be another planet. This is another planet. This is Jupiter. It's a fantasy picture of Jupiter conceived by the astronomer Carl Sagan. And he's imagining life forms that might live in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, called floaters. If there were life forms in Jupiter, they would be called Jovians. So let's use the word by Jovians for creatures on this Earth that are so odd that they might almost be from another planet. Here, for instance, is a deep sea fish. You would have to go on a long journey in a submarine or in a diving suit to see that fish. This is exactly the same species of fish. The only difference 